Uh, she first ran for office uh, in 2004. She had already worked at the county for about seven years, and she was working in the IT department. She knew that uh, IT would be a very big factor in taking a job to be an election officer because lots was changing uh, with the technology. She also had worked in uh, a department that had gave her some good, strong real estate uh, skills, so that was important. Uh, she did win, you won in 2004 then, right? Yes. Uh, her background is uh, in education. She took a BS in business, majoring in accounting from Emporia State. And of course, you know, there's always numbers to everything. <laughs> Uh, during the time she's been uh, the uh, election officer and clerk, um, four years ago she was elected to the executive board of the Kansas County Clerks and Election Officials Association. She first served as a treasurer, then moved on to secretary, vice president, and ended as the president, and that was in September 1st of 2019. During that time she was able to pass uh, 2019 and not 2000, yeah, 2019 and 2020 legislative platforms for their association and also testified on numerous bills at the Capitol. She looks forward to serving on Vote Center team assembled by the Secretary of State's office and plans to continue being active on the legislative uh, committee. She has three children. Her oldest graduated in 2019. Uh, a daughter just graduated this past July. She's now off in Redmond, Washington at a college, Digafin Institute of Technology, where she's learning to write games, computer games, right? Um, coding. They coding. Can, they'll also do animation for movies and stuff. There's yeah. coding behind all that. So it's all that great technology that kids love. And her youngest, I think, is a son, and he's a senior at Park City High School. So with that, I guess we're ready to, yep. to go. Yep. Okay, Karen, you want to come on up? Yeah. So I had the pleasure of speaking roughly, oh. I think. Let's see. Yes. This, this will advance your okay. slides, and I think you just use this. Yeah, you have to turn it on. Oh, yeah, we got to get it turned. <laughs> That's always good. A year ago, so I left a couple yeah. of my slides because. At that, and I'm starting out with my, this is my daughter's math, um, school, Digipen, so oh, it's, it's a little more muffled, so if it's hard to hear me, let me know. I have another mask I can put on that maybe isn't. Uh -huh. I know she does, what she does. Is she around the fires? Um, she, they're kind of all around. They're a little farther south and east of where she's at, because Redmond is about the same distance with uh, huge rivers whatever it's called, separating Seattle and Redmond. So, and they're, they have, she has mountains all around her, so they're in like a bowl. So right now the biggest worry for them is air quality. They have, yeah. she hasn't really been able to go outside much, no windows, but sadly, it's cooler here than it is there, and they don't have air conditioning out there, so you can't have your windows open because the air quality is bad, and it's like 90 out there. Oh my. So she, she keeps calling me. She's like, Mom, what is the deal? I came out here to get cooler, yeah. <laughs> and it's following me. So, um, and it hasn't rained since she's been out there. We left October, August 19th, and um, I, we, her and I drove her car out there, packed full of stuff, and got out there that Friday. <clears throat> Spent three days, went through Wyoming, Utah, Idaho. It was awesome. Yeah. And then um, we were there for... Um, I flew back on the Monday, the 24th, and she's been out there going crazy ever since. She's been to Seattle, took the bus, Pikes Market. She's sporting her Kansas cowboy hat, you know, because she's a Kansas girl out there and stuff. So she's she's having fun, and I've had a few breakdowns, but overall, <laughs> my, my poor Uber driver when I left her because I Ubered to the airport and. I felt so sorry for him, I'm telling you. He tried everything. I was like ugly crying. <laughs> like I couldn't breathe. And he's like, water, trying to talk about anything else that wasn't her. So he was pretty awesome. And it was it was like totally hands down the best trip I've ever done. I wouldn't trade that time that we had or anything. So. But she's keeping an eye on it, and I have. And they have a Discord for um, family members of DigiPen students. And so there's... 
several parents that live around the area that are posting on it saying that they've been keeping track and that it has to go through the mountains and the rivers and it's virtually impossible for the fires. Nothing's impossible, but virtually, because they're in that a bowl yeah. kind of thing. It's just more the air quality that they're worried about right now. But it's supposed to improve tomorrow and Monday, so I think they must be getting either the fires under control or maybe some winds blowing away or something like that. So, yeah. So hopefully it is, and hopefully the temperature will drop for her and she'll be a little happier. So, so. Um, Anyway, <laughs> um, so when I spoke about a year ago, we were just gearing up for the 19th Amendment. I bought some shirts, some of my other staff have too. Pretty excited um, back, that was pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And so I had all these grand plans and I wanted to have special stuff at the polling places and do all of these outreach things. And just like any great plan, it kind of fell apart because then I had to totally change focus and it was all about buying hand sanitizer and masks and gloves and figuring out how to take things off and crowd control devices. And I'm telling you, before the August election, I felt like I was this stream of flowing out money and it was like Christmas in my office because every day we were getting more and more items and the Secretary of State's office was sending us stuff because they got CARES Act money and they were, um, trying to help us out as best they could too. And at that time, hand sanitizer was just barely mm -hmm. starting to pick up. So luckily we had plenty. And now, not kidding, I have boxes stacked <laughs> up and down. Because every, we were also scared that we wouldn't have, because we knew we'd have double the um, voting turnout mm -hmm. and possibly even better than that. Because we had 32% turnout in August. And I'm expecting at least 65% turnout. Wow. I'm hoping even higher than that and and partially it's due to um i sent out a mailer back in april when everything started and when we did we sent out applications for the august and november because kansas law says you have to request one every single time so we took advantage of that opportunity and all of the ones that we processed for the primary we called people if they only sent one back because it's hard to explain it in a letter and for people to understand so they look almost exactly the same other than a small date and so we spent time back then calling people and saying, hey, did you really, did you wanna go ahead and get one for November? So we pretty much got one for all of them and then we've been getting them by leaps and bounds now. So my staff's just two other people besides myself and they've all been, they've been working great too. We've processed about um, close to 3,000 so far and we didn't start until, well, and I was gone for like a week taking my daughter out too. and. So we started then, and we have about 1,600 left. I'm hoping by Friday we'll have all of the ones that we have processed so that we can, two things, one, start moving on to other things, but a lot of people have been calling because I can't hardly remember what I did yesterday, and so a lot of people don't remember that they requested two of them. And so right now we're kind of in a holding pattern saying, hey, give us till the 21st. We should have everything processed. Some people we can look up and see that we have it, and some people I'm pretty sure are in our, one of our stacks that we have left to process. So hopefully by the 21st, if anybody asks, and a lot of it is I think, I'm pretty sure that one of the states has maybe already sent ballots out, I'm not sure, but we don't send ballots out until October 14th. Mm -hmm. And so, with, and with everything in the media, I think it's throwing everyone, they think the election's like right now and they should already have their ballot, but. Mm -hmm. I don't even have my ballot rotation yet from the Secretary of State's office, so I haven't even started programming that. We do have to send ballots out. We'll send them out by Friday. Um, overseas, mm -hmm. um, military, those ballots have to go out by law by Saturday. And so I'll be spending this week trying to get all of my programming and stuff finished so we can get those ballots out to them. But they're the only ones, and we have I think right now we have about 25 people that have requested. Most of those will email instead of snail mailing because there's been some, um, this year of course, they redid a lot of the postal contracts and some of the countries didn't get signed and so there's a few issues with on the ground, in the mail, um, mail. And so the majority of those people have um, requested by email, so it'll go a lot faster. So honestly, if it goes like August did, we'll probably have our first actual ballots in the office by Saturday, because they'll usually email, so they get the email on Friday, and there are several of them that voted immediately and then emailed it back, and it's sitting in my email box ready for Saturday, and then 
So kind of for us, it, it'll start by a week from this Monday. We'll start getting those, not very many, but we've been getting everything, um, all of our processes in place to begin mailing ballots out October 14th. So anyway, I digress. So anyhow, any chance I get, I'm still trying to promote the, the 19th Amendment, the 100 years for that and everything. So that's kind of what I wanted to make sure. Women in elected administration positions, um, very exciting to me. I love seeing strong women in whichever party it is, um, getting involved in the process and being leaders and all that kind of stuff. So I really enjoy reading different things. Um, Registering to vote, I can't talk about anything election-wise without talking about that first. Um, there are websites, ksvotes.org is not, it's a not-for-profit organization that runs it, so it's not a government agency, but from what I've seen, it's worked really well, and people can register to vote. They don't have to print anything off. They can either, if it's on their phone, you can use your finger. If you have your computer, they can use your mouse to sign their name, and then it emails me. And I get several, several emails every day. There's advanced applications on the website and they also have voter registration. It emails me a copy and then we get everything processed. Um, my only caveat is it's not a government run, but it is a very legitimate site and we definitely direct people because the turnaround of getting that, those um, registrations is a lot faster and as the deadline nears, which the deadline to register to vote is October, the Tuesday after the 4th. 13th. Yeah, the 13th, the Tuesday before. <laughs> 13th of October, 21 days before the election. So, and then we'll start mailing ballots out October 14th. Um, KSVotes.org. And I have to correct this. I had this one from the time before. We changed our website back in May. We changed, we went to a new website. And so instead of election-2, it's voting and elections is the part that it goes to. But if you go to calicounty.org, you can go to the um, departments and it's the clerk's website that has all of that information and stuff. And I'm trying to keep things on our front page and I'm gonna try to get some more election information about drop boxes and when advanced voting starts and all that kind of thing. So um, the address for the clerk's office right there. You can register at the city offices too. I, I'm not 100% sure that they're all great about having the voter registration cards. They're supposed to and pass them out. No outpost that I know of actually collects them. They go ahead and, and, and honestly, we encourage them not to collect them. Give the voters the, or the potential voters the forms and let them get them to our office. We have a drop box outside of our office now that I set up back in March when everything started happening. They can drop them in there, bring them to the office, mail them, they can email them. I've given my phone number out, people have texted them to me. We're just more than, they can fax it, always fax, but more than willing to try to, to help the voter get it to us any way that they, we, they can. And so a lot of people, when it gets closer to deadlines, that's why I give my phone number out and text, because most everybody has a smartphone and they know how to take a picture and then send that picture. And so they'll take a picture of it and then they can text it to me. I can send it to myself, print it off, and we can get everything processed. And it's all legitimate and follows the rules that are allowed for getting things here to us. Um, so to move right into security, we first have our physical security in um, my actual office. We have multiple cameras in the office at various doors that are on all the time, that can be viewed at any point in time. Um, my office where the programming computer is and the storage area that we have, all of the election equipment, have two keys, one I have with me all the time and one um, is available only for my staff in a different place than yet another locked box that only my staff has access to in case they need to get into it. Um, we have a a large cabinet for the voted ballots that has a lock and once we start getting those ballots back the ballots go in there every night and then we put a seal on it every night in a couple of different spots on top of locking it but the lock for it's a generic type of lock that came with it and so we put the seal on it so that 
when I'm in my office, because we work different hours and stuff, my staff knows that there's two seals on it. They know what the numbers are. You can see it's the kind of seal that puts on and then when you pull it off, it does that. It leaves part of the, um, the paint on or pull some of the paint off of the seal, so there's a way to do that. I never open it um, without somebody else there. If I get there earlier than everyone else, we wait and we, as a team, go in there to um, undo it and then start working some of the ballots and stuff. And we have it open during the day, like um, working with the ballots and things. Um, what else? For our physical, I think that that's pretty much it as far as office physical security how we're trying to make sure the um, storage the unit that I have that stores the voted ballots isn't a hundred percent fireproof but it's the closest I could get within the realm of dollars that I had and so it's totally metal it's on rollers we can um, shift it around if they need to but I'm pretty confident that even unless we had something that totally annihilated our building that the voted ballots in there would be safe as well because to me security is not only keeping somebody from tampering with it but I have to be able to make sure that I feel secure enough that those ballots are gonna withstand the kinds of things that can happen you never know if there's a fire or um, and we have sprinkler systems too in our, our building but a fire or a tornado in Kansas or you know something like that to make sure that the integrity of those voted ballots are because we mail them out October 14th, start getting them in, and then the majority of them, not the majority, but a large number of them come back almost immediately. So there's a two-week time frame where there's ballots that are sealed and not opened, and, and there's no record of what that vote is. And so I feel like I need to take all precautions I can to make sure that at the point that we open those ballots that we can. <clears throat> Voting machine security. Um, I know that they've had some hacker conferences and things, and, and they, they absolutely have hacked into the machines. What I try to make sure people realize is that they have physical access to those machines. Like, the machine is here, and they are actually sitting here and messing around with it. Um, putting a USB in it or being close enough and staying there for a long period of time to try and um, get into it however it is that they do or they can actually connect things to it. Our voting equipment is not left unsecure and even on election day the tabulator itself because the express votes that we have are just glorified pens now all they do is mark the ballot those tabulators have somebody standing at them at all times and nobody has physical access to that to do anything with the thumb drive that's in it or the unit itself. We have lots of workers that are watching and people especially now because of COVID, it makes it even better because they're paying more attention and making sure even more that somebody isn't staying too long because if somebody's in a spot before that person before another person goes to that spot, it gets cleaned and sanitized and everything. And so I have more staff at the polling locations to make sure that there's a flow so nobody can actually have physical access to it. That part of the lack of long-term physical access has been there for a while, but now with COVID and making sure that people move through the polling places and there's no chit-chatty, there's no lingering, there's nothing like that gets people in and out, which lessens the chances for that. Sealed and locks, we talked about once the programming is done, everything's tested, the machines are sealed up that tabulate. There are um, seals placed, lock seals that are on them, and um, the numbers are written down and sent out to the supervising judge so that when they cut that off, they know what numbers are supposed to be. They're trained to check that seal number with the seal that they were given and so that, that that way that they can make sure that it was closed up from us and then opened by them the next day without having a different seal put in place or anything. Um, have the same types of things in our office too, like I talked about with the ballots themselves. 
Um, we have cameras, <clears throat> and I am getting ready to put um, a drop box down in Arc City as well. We're purchasing a camera. We already have a system set up, but we're pur purchasing an additional camera that will be strictly on that drop box at all times. It's going to be bolted down to the ground just like the one at um, outside of my office is. Uh, the Secretary of State's office has purchased two for every county, and so those are supposed to be here the week of the 14th, that, the week of the 12th. They're supposed to be here that Monday at the latest. And our maintenance staff already has things ready. We are talking to the city to make sure where we put that one down at 119 South Summit in front of the county attorney's office is where Arc Cities will be and have the camera system set up our IT departments making sure the camera will be on that one. We already have a camera out in front of the 321 East 10th and Winfield building. So there will be a camera on that at all times. There, my office will be the only ones that have keys. I'm in the process of getting a Republican and a Democrat to agree um, every day, afternoon-ish, to come to our office, check out the key, get their log, drive down to Arc City together, open up the box, pull out the ballots, count how many there are, log them in there, and then bring them back up to us where we'll verify the log count, take the key back from them, and then they're done for that day and they'll come back the next day. At seven o'clock, those same, hopefully same two people, will be down at the ballot drop box in Arc City at seven o'clock because nobody can drop a ballot in there after seven. And then they'll do the same thing. They'll have checked out the stuff from us on election day, they'll go down, pick up the ballots, and then I'll have them put something on there that Dropbox closed or something like that. After the election's over that week, we'll remove that Dropbox and it'll come back into my office until the next election. My plan is to always have that down there now, as long as I can. I'm looking at purchasing, because we have extra dollars right now, purchasing maybe another one or two, and I'm kicking around the idea of maybe putting one up around Udall and maybe burden to try and get some outlying areas. I just don't know if I'm going to have everything logistically for November, well, by the middle of October to have that in place, but I'm hoping that I can get everything figured out with the cameras and all that kind of stuff that we'd have to have there as well to have that finished so that it can be a norm and always have those drop boxes available to people. So I'm hopeful that the voting by mail, if people can see that a lot of the media coverage maybe isn't as dire as what they think and maybe just different in our area, you know, I'm not really sure. So that people will have confidence in getting a ballot mailed to them and then not necessarily using the mail to send it back, but being able to drop it in a box that two different parties of people are going to bring them physically back to us and pull the postal service out of the equation except for obviously sending the ballot out. There's nothing I can do about that. The law says I have to actually mail it out and that defeats the purpose if not. So I'm hopeful that each election it will get better like that. That's my plan. If I don't have the ones for the two outlying areas this time, <clears throat> I'm hopeful that we can so that I can keep people voting in those same ways even once hopefully a vaccine comes and the COVID is a distant memory. I still think that it's an easy way for people to vote and especially younger people. And if I get, that's one of the legislative platforms I've tried to do any prior to any of this was to make it even easier. One application for the year, just like you Okava, if you sent one in that would put you on the list for that entire year, maybe not forever because we're kind of a nomadic society and we move a lot. And you would have to request it every January, but it would be easier to say, oh, well, you know, it's January 1st, I'll go ahead and send in my application, and then I'm good for the year. If there's a special election, I would get a ballot. If there's a city school election, and I'm hopeful that by sending out applications next year, that I can increase our city school turnout because that's extremely low. And I'm hoping that by mailing out ballots and having other options for dropping them off that I can help increase voter participation as well. So, ballot programming. I do the programming in-house. Um, we test in the office. My staff does, um, they hand count, 
the ballads is probably their least favorite thing to do <laughs> because there's so many and they have to do and then a lot of times we'll run it through the machine and the count's off and every single time the count's been off it's been because they've miscounted something so you know at that point they have to go back and we do some verification and that kind of thing so um, lots and lots and lots of testing that's what I'll be doing this week before we actually <clears throat> do it programming with the ballot marking devices making sure that those are manually counted the way that they have been voted so that when it goes through the machine and the machine's reading the barcode that it's actually reading it the way that it needs to read it same with the paper ballots when they're marked it sends it into a different code channel and that machine reads the position of the oval and so that's the reason we do so much testing is because if it's off where that oval is, it totally would throw off the count. And so if you have Trump and Biden in nearly the same place, but somebody kind of marks down here, and we try to mark like the ballots that we see, not every, but they're small ovals, not everybody gets it right in there. We try and overmark and undermark and run it through the machine and test. Okay, well, if somebody marks it this far outside, which which race, which person is it gonna actually count when it goes through the machine? So we mess around, or however you wanna say it, with coloring in ovals in various spots, even totally outside of it, just to make sure that it says, hey, there's unreadable mark. So we, that's also part of all of the testing that we do. And with programming my own, it gives us the opportunity to fine tune that, I believe, more than if I paid to have a program somewhere else. I have the benefit, I also have some IT in my background, so it's been easier for me to roll through the programming the entire time. I've always programmed our own. So it's just been, a, I feel like, a real big benefit for us. Dropbox Security, I kind of already talked about what we have there. Um, paper ballot. So when we get an, I'll start from the beginning. When we get an application, when we're working those applications, we verify a driver's license that's on there. We verify um, the address that they have on there and we verify the signature. So if the signature at that point in time doesn't match, we get hold of the person and try to rectify that signature, whether we need to get an updated one. A lot of it's more, making sure that that person's the one actually requesting the ballot and somebody's not requesting it for them. And so just getting hold of them, verifying a phone number that's on there with what we already have in the system and talking to the person and saying, hey, it just doesn't quite look like your signature. Just wanted to make sure that you really wanted to get this ballot. And I've, I've never had somebody say, no, that's not me. How in the world did you get that? Uh -huh. They're like, oh yeah, you know, I was in a hurry or whatever. And some of our signatures that we have are the digital ones from the DMV. So, and everybody's signature is so different when it's that electronic yeah. kind oh, versus yes. pen and There's paper. There's no yes. way that you could get yeah, exactly. my, it looks yeah. so different. <laughs> yeah, when it I is. Do. And what we're finding, honestly, with some, I say younger kids, like my kids, they were two years apart. One of them, the older one learned cursive and my younger ones didn't, thankfully. There was a teacher, um, Linda Newby, who they had, and she knew that they really needed to kind of learn cursive, so she carved out time in her day to teach them cursive because she knew it would be important. I'm amazed at how many, because those kids are 19, 18, 20 now, how many of them don't have a signature and they print, and mm -hmm. that's their signature. And so when you print, your printing absolutely changes a lot, at least in cursive. Usually, you can tell them. I've been through some trainings with verifying signatures because I'm, I'm not an expert. None of my staff is either. But you can tell when somebody lifts up their pen and how many times they lift it up if they're trying to. Um, letters that kind of are the same. Some people consistently will write like up, consistently write down just a little bit. And there's nuances in signatures. And the more signatures that we get on file that we can look at and compare, it's interesting to see that some people's signatures will change, but those qualities of it always stay the same. They may actually change the way they make an S, 
But if they always slant up, even when they change the way they do their eyes, they always slant up. There's just different things to kind of look at when we are, again, knowing we're not experts, but we're you know doing the best we can. We've all been through the training of things to look at that maybe would be a false signature, something, just any little different thing that would tip us off to allow us to call the person and say, hey, something's not quite right. So anyway, so the application, we're verifying all that, and then it goes in the system, then on the 14th, we get all of the ballots actually mailed out. Once they go to the person and they vote it and they bring it back, when it bring it back or mail it back, we then peel off the back part, we verify the address that they've written on there. If they haven't written an address, we try to get hold of them, at least get a verbal that maybe they haven't moved or something like that. Some people get their mail in a PO box. So if they write their PO box, we always call them to make sure that they haven't moved because if they have moved, that then throws them into another category of a challenged ballot provisional. Not that it won't count, we just have to jump through some more hoops to make sure that we get that situation rectified and everything. And then we verify that signature again. And so we make sure that that signature of that voted ballot matches the ones that we have on file, most recent one being the application that they sent in. So a signature on a voted ballot actually gets checked twice. So I feel like that's a nice extra layer of security. And even if we could get it so that one application every year, if somebody's signature does change because health issues, and we have some signatures that are from, literally I was eight years old when these people signed, and that's the newest signature that we have. And they're maybe 75 or 80 years old now. And I mean, your signature just changes as you get older somewhat. So, um, to get that updated signature every year, I, I feel like that would be helpful too. So um, that's how we keep track of the ballots that are returned. We balance out every day. So we log, we do that with the applications too. So we, we work 400 applications a day in the office. We print a report that goes by date. We count all the applications that we have and then we match it up and some days it matches, and some days we then spend the next hour and a half alphabetizing those, printing out the detailed list, and figuring out which one. Either there was a date that was changed, or it was a duplicate, but we put it in again. And if we get a duplicate application, the system only allows us to send one ballot out to them. There's, You can send an application every single day if you want, and there's only one that's going to be sent out. Um, if somebody were to get a ballot sent out to them and it says advanced and then they try to go to the polls and vote also it shows up in the poll book advanced and that throws that person into a different category some people are like well i never got the ballot or anything like that but it doesn't matter necessarily at that point if they're at the polls they then vote a provisional ballot which goes in a separate envelope a separate place and that ballot itself is not counted at that point in time we then, after the election, do research and say, okay, well, did we log that ballot returned from that person? And if we did, then we don't count that provisional. If we never received that ballot back, or maybe we received it back and it was returned from the post office for a bad address, or sometimes we're clueless as to why it got returned, but it got returned anyway. And if it if it's in our possession unvoted, we would count that other ballot because obviously that person's not voting twice. So there are lots of things that get said in the media that sound like somebody could just easily vote multiple times or anything like that. But it, it's harder when you're on the inside than people necessarily realize. But if, if you don't understand the procedures that go on on the backside, it would be very easy to believe how easy it would be for somebody to get a ballot in the mail and then go vote in person, and there you go, they just voted twice. Mm -hmm. And it, I can't speak mm -hmm. for every state, but I can speak for Kansas, and I have a really close relationship with a lot of my, with my colleagues in the state, and we all do the same processes. Everybody balances out like that. When you get your logged ballots, we pull the, it's a different report, but it's the same type of report. You're supposed to have 512 ballots or ballots logged that day, and you get the report, and it's 510. You're alphabetizing those. You're pulling the detailed report. One person's reading, one person's writing, and an hour and a half later, 
you figure out whatever the error was. Maybe, you know, obviously we get phone calls and we get interrupted, and so it's not a perfect process. So, um, I, I, at least half the time, we don't balance and we're doing the same thing. And it's like a holding of the breath. You can feel it every day when we go, okay, how many did you have? How many did you have? How many did you have? And it's like, okay, what's the report say? And it's just quiet. <laughs> and then it's like, yay, or okay, recount your pile. Because maybe, like Friday, that was the problem. It was just a miscounting, yeah. which is so much easier than anything else. But, and, and that happens with the log ballots too. Sometimes you get interrupted while you're counting. Somebody asks you a question. It's just, you know, we're doing, more, we're multitasking while we're doing it. But until we know it balances for sure, we're not done with that group and we don't move on to the next group. So more of the things that we're doing there making sure. Um, the audit afterwards, Emily was a part of that, <laughs> so she can even testify to what that is. We get people that have not worked the election process in the counting of the ballots. So anybody who's worked on election day, I don't choose them either, even though they're not involved in the counting of the ballots. I feel like the audit group that I have needs to be independent of anything that's went on with the election up to that point. So even if they're the ones that, this is my theory on, even if they're the ones this time that are going to go pick up the ballots from Mark City, I don't want that team a part of my audit because I want to make sure that when that audit team comes in, they've not touched any piece of that election at all. So nobody can say anything. So we've already drawn randomly at that point in time, know which ones. They go through the ballots that have been sealed on election night. They open them up. They have to sort through, first of all, for the precinct, which takes the majority of the time. And then once they have all those, and I know how many ballots should be from that particular precinct in there, and again, we balance and match up. And if we don't, they have to then go through some more again <laughs> to try and find what's missing because maybe they've missed one or two of the ballots that are in there. So once we know that, then they'll start, um, one person reads and two people will write that race. And then they finish out and I have my results that they don't know what they are and then I'll show them what it is and they show me what it is. And thankfully so far, we've done two, two audits. It's been spot on both times, so we haven't had anything. Um, if ever there's a discrepancy, I would say probably that discrepancy will end up coming from a mark, a mismark, a judgment mark. But again, we do checks on the programming before, so we try and mark those ballots outside so that I know how that machine is going to count that ballot before it ever rolls through and all of the randomness that people do on ballots. <laughs> Mary's seen that. Lots of varieties on the ballots and so I like to think that maybe that's why because I already know if they look at this ballot and it's got the marking anywhere within this realm that machine is going to have counted it in this way and so I'm hoping as long as everything goes along and I keep doing that that our audits will continue to turn out exactly the way that they have but that law was passed in 19 the spring of 19 and went into effect Thankfully, we got to do it in a smaller city school first, kind of worked out the kinks of what it was, and then um, implemented it again in August, and we'll do another audit um, after November. We usually um, do the audit two days after, so the election's Tuesday. We usually do the um, audit on Thursday, and it takes maybe four hours, three and a half, something like that. It, it'll take a little longer this time because um, we should have twice the ballots that we had the last time. So, Which talks about you have people in from different parties too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I always try and have things. That's why mm -hmm. Phil and Mary are great because we don't have a lot of Democrats in this area. <laughs> so finding Republicans is easy. <laughs> Truly, it is. And since. They always think they need to leave town around election now yeah. and stuff like that. So they kind of quit work on election day. The timing of it really worked well because it's great having both of them in there. Then I have two Democrats. Maybe they're in cahoots together because they live together, but you know, they're in the same party. So, and then it, it, it just works really well. I do the same thing when we, um, I have a board that opens up the advanced ballots mm -hmm. and starts running them through. This time I think we're gonna start because we're going to have even more. 
um, the afternoon before the election. There's no tabulation, it doesn't get close, so there's no way to know what any of the results are on that until after. But I think I'm gonna have them come in and that board also is bipartisan. Eleven, uh, El Evelyn Shope came the last time and helped and she was my Democrat. So uh, again, it's always harder to get somebody that's the Democrat to come in and, 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 and do that kind of thing. So anybody who is a Democrat, if you have names of people that wanna work election day, because obviously we need that same bipartisan on election day at the polling places. Some of my smaller places only have four or five people, <coughs> excuse me, working. And at least one of them needs to be a Democrat. So um, we've got a really good group so far of um, variety, but um, there's always things that come up with people this time there, you know, people had good intentions before August and then our numbers started climbing in this area and people just kind of said, you know, I'm not comfortable. I had supervising judge who actually tested positive for COVID mm -hmm. right before the election. So obviously, mm -hmm. and she was pretty much cleared. She'd been past her two week mark, but I just, I wasn't comfortable having her there. It was mm -hmm. in a small t town area. And you know, even though it's protected, everybody knew she'd gotten tested, everybody knew she tested positive. And so I just didn't think that, that was a comfortable place to ask people to come vote you know, when they knew. I mean, if you don't know and you have no idea, it's one thing, but when you know somebody did. But she's back, she's healthy, and she's like, you could, that just proves, because she's like 77, she goes, <laughs> but you can be 77, have COVID, and still survive, and yes, I'm working in November, so <laughs> she's definitely should be safe this time, so it's been really good. Um, a lot of what the media is getting hold of and talking about meddling with the election delve deep into what it is. I mean, obviously, we've been warned in the office, which to me was, I sh you know, you should know, but back long ago before the meddling in elections, other countries would come watch our democratic process because our democratic process is one to mimic. I mean, we truly have a great democratic process. Even with its flaws, we do. Um, and, and other countries would come over. Well, those other countries are still wanting to try to come, but without the authorization. And so we've been instructed, which again, like I already would have known, that nobody is to come in and watch the election from another country. Obviously, we can have poll watchers, and they're appointed by a candidate and that kind of thing, but if they're trying to appoint somebody from another country, there are a lot more hoops that somebody's going to have to go through. So versus somebody that lives here and is a registered voter and they get appointed and, you know, by whichever candidate it is too. So it, it's not going to stop any of the poll watching. It just is another heightened awareness that that could be a way for somebody to come in because if they come in, they then have physical access to it. And physical access is the key to securing the election because none of our equipment have any type of Wi-Fi, so it would be like trying to hack into the wall. I mean, it, it, it's, it is impossible because there is no Wi-Fi or means to do it. But I can get into that wall if I physically have access to it. So, <clears throat> that part. Um, misinformation, that's the whole the Russians try to spin something, Chinese try to spin something. That all does interfere with the election. It interferes with the way people think about the way that they're voting. I mean, it can be talking about mail fraud that really isn't necessarily there. I mean, I'm not saying that postal employees haven't been guilty in the past of throwing away mail or hoarding it or something, but I feel like the majority of them are there to do their job and they're not there going, oh no, I know this person, it's a Republican ballot, I'm gonna throw it in the trash and not take it in. I, I'm, I, I can't say that that doesn't happen, but I feel like for the most part that we're somewhat safe from that. I, again, there's, um, there's a website that people can check if they've actually put their ballot in the mail. When we log it, it'll show up on that. It's um, ksvotes.org, it's the opposite of the other one. And you can actually track if your application's been received. Um, it, our, our system, our ELP voter system updates that system. Um, it, when the ballot's been mailed, you can 
see that. And then on the back side, when we log the ballot, and obviously when we get hundreds and hundreds, there's no way for my small staff to log all of the ballots we received, but they work really hard, all of us do, trying to get them logged as soon as we can. So you can track it that way too, or they can call our office. And we're more than happy to look it up and say, yes, we've gotten that ballot. And, and, and they can call every day if they want. If they don't want to get on the website, call every day. I mean, we don't mind at all looking. It takes just a minute to look it up and say, oh yeah, we logged that ballot. And then that person at least has the comfort of knowing they dropped it in the mail, it's been received in the office. And if for some reason it doesn't and doesn't, we can mail replacement ballots out. And if we were to mail a replacement ballot out and then the ballot comes, we have the same type of process that we do for somebody voting advance and in person with a provisional ballot. We, if we've already logged one ballot, then the other ballot becomes provisional. And that one then would be recommended not to count. Obviously our board of canvassers are the ones that, that have that final say, but I, in my 15 years, they've never went against my recommendation of it because we've done the research, we know. I have the laws in front of me, I show them what it is, what we found out, why it is what it is, and they're just like, okay, I mean, you know, you've done it. The only ones that I'll leave kind of for them is, we've had a few signatures in the past that have been questionable when they've come back and we've tried to get hold of the person and tried to send out a registration card and we just haven't. And and those I totally leave in their hands to say, do you think this looks like, you know, it's another three sets of eyes. After mm -hmm. all of our office, because we always pass those around in the office, hey, look at this one, what do you think? This one, what do you think? Um, and then they've made those decisions. But honestly, in all the years, it's been a handful of ballots. Granted, we have more mail ballots right now, but um, in the past, the majority of our ballots were um, permanent advance, which they have to have had a disability. They don't fill out an application every year. They're just always sent a ballot. And if they've got an issue as it is, odds are their signature has deteriorated more through the years. And sometimes their signature gets better magically. And those are usually the ones that we question because that person has to sign before that has changed as well before they that person had to sign no matter what that signature was and we could always call and say you know did you vote this ballot and, blah, 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 and we can get like verbal verification um, now there's actually a place where the voter doesn't have to sign it at all and somebody can assist someone and they sign it and and in that case we don't have there, there's no signature to verify we just verify that that person has said I didn't coerce this person, I did, you know, as they instructed, and I'm signing it. And just like a lot of things in life, you have to make a leap of faith at some point. And, and honestly, that's one of those things that it's just our leap of faith that that person's signing it under penalties and, you know, crimes if it gets found out that they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. But, but again, on that, since my office staff is small, if, for example, Maureen, we started logging ballots and we saw three, four, mm -hmm. 10, 30 with the same name, <laughs> yeah. we would question it. Mm -hmm. All of us would. That's, and that's, all, all of the addresses would be a nursing home. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and it, it doesn't mean it's not legit and that she's not a worker, but yeah. we've it. called people mm -hmm. and called and asked not that person necessarily if it's mm -hmm. where it is, but done some investigating. I, I've never had that happen this, that in that case, but we've had a few in nursing home cases where we've called and kind of asked some questions. You know, that's all we can do. If I have suspicion, I can turn things over to the county attorney and they can actually do a real investigation and prosecute the person if it is. But at least in our area, that's what I'm trying, because that's all I can speak to for sure, is that those are the kinds of things that we watch for. We always since I took office have um, the law actually just changed to kind of make us do it but I've done it since I took office if somebody doesn't sign it we drive it around and we get the signature I've driven all over the county with a ballot that I've checked out from the office my staff knows I'm leaving with it and I go to that person's house we've already called them they sign the ballot I take it back to the office my staff knows here's the ones I had this person didn't end up being home 
here's the ones I didn't, there's the log of the ballots so that they're, even though they're just in my hands at that point in time, I had my staff do it, one of my staff members did this last time, but we know which ballots are leaving and have a log of what that is. And then on the flip side, when it comes back, that signature is verified and it's not verified by me. Somebody else is verifying. If I went out and got the signatures, I'm not logging those ballots. If my, when my staff went out this last time, I logged the ballots so that I had a check of, you know, she's not signing the ballot. I mean, you know, just another check. I don't, there's not a doubt in my mind that she would sign it. And I mean, I know I wouldn't and they know I wouldn't too, but it's just that extra double check of um, security that I implemented to try to make sure that that um, that my office can be trusted, honestly, because mm -hmm. that's what I get elected on and that's what helps my voter turn out in my area is mm -hmm. if people believe that we're doing everything that we can, mm -hmm. that that they'll um, that they'll continue to vote and believe that their vote actually mm -hmm. counts and matters and all that kind of stuff. So surely big counties, big cities can't do that. Um mm -hmm. on the scale it seems over and above they <laughs> They do, but they have more staff mm -hmm. to do it. I mean, like Johnson County has like 40 people working in their office. Sedgwick County um, has some extra um, issues this time. Their election commissioner has some health issues that are um, really bad, but she has a really good deputy that's been there with her for a while and she's stepped up and she's making sure a lot of those things. And I know Tabitha's doing a lot from the hospital and from home and more, I know more than she should be, but she's trying to keep an eye on things. And, and, and truly they do, because I, I mean, I talk, to, I talk to Tabitha all the time, and I have for years, and there's a lot of mimicking of things so that, that, that we do. It's just on a different scale, and, and um, I mean, you can still have the same thing. If these people go out and get signatures, other people log them, and they have other, you know, different things logging. Yeah, I, I'd say in a bigger county, it's a bigger chance because they're hiring temps somewhat. A lot of them have to hire temporary people to come log applications and log ballots and that kind of thing. And my staff would love for me to have done that and I almost did it this time, but I struggle doing that here in mine because I'm a control freak. <laughs> and I feel like while I know my election workers do great, when you don't live the election like we live it, you don't pick up on things and you don't see different things. And just like um, if your name was on 30 different ballots, yes, I think it would be harder for them mm -hmm. to notice that, but a lot of times those ballots roll through all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so if you've trained your staff to kind of watch for that kind of thing, which I'm pretty sure Johnson and Sedgwick and them do train their people that log to watch for some of those little things. I mean, they, they train them to what to look at for signatures, you know, the best that we can, not being professional signature artists or whatever they're called that compare that and stuff. But those people who are professionals are the ones who have trained us. And we go through that training every two years. And this time it was on Zoom, but it's FBI agents who this is, this is their job. And it's free training that we get to have and they fly here, or like this time they didn't get to fly, but they do the Zoom. When we have our conferences, that's the kind of, we do all kinds of different security trainings and things so that it just, um, just like reminding, if there's a, a person from another country that says they're supposed to watch, come in and look at the election, you know, when you're busy and you're frazzled and, and all that kind of stuff, it would be easy if somebody hadn't reminded you of that, maybe mm -hmm. to say, oh yeah, go ahead. but. It's, it's all those reminders and we get lots of those reminders every year and it's like, oh yeah, I'd forgotten that. I mean, because we have other things that we do, you know, as well in our mm -hmm. office and, you know, time makes it hard to remember everything. Mm -hmm. Would it be helpful uh, or would it even be legal to do it, but to have so you have a check on their signature too. Uh, and at least then you're not overwhelmed when you see 10 or 20, you know, signatures from someone that wasn't the actual voter. Uh, that would just give you kind of a heads up. Yeah, and usually like the activity directors, Kayla's got a good relationship with them because yeah. 
she's sending permanent advanced applications and the mm -hmm. voter registration because as they get new people in and they get certain times when they are. So they're honestly, they're really good at letting us know different things like that. And, and we've had them on the flip side say, you know, hey, I, this, this person isn't capable of any type of thing, but their family members want to make sure that they get a ballot. I mean, there's nothing I can do yeah. about those little instances, but I mean, mm -hmm. those happen as well. And, and truly, if anyone's looking at voter fraud, absolutely your nursing homes are the biggest place. Mm. A few, gosh, probably eight years ago now, I think, it might even be more, they have <clears throat> passed the law, it used to be before vote centers, but you could have a mobile <clears throat> election at nursing homes. And I truly didn't feel that we had an abundance of an issue like that. I mean, a, f a few things, and, and I, I did not do those before. Um, Right now, it would be virtually impossible because the nursing oh, homes aren't totally. allowing my board workers mm -hmm. to come. But once they do, and I've gotten even more processes in place, I would like to try that. My struggle with that in the past was I didn't feel like I could go to one without mm -hmm. going to every single one in the entire county. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot. Mm -hmm. We've been able to get some kind of some extra names, not extra because right now we need all of them, don't get me wrong, but in an election where maybe I don't need quite as many workers and now I have a few more names, I'm, I'm looking at trying to figure out how once COVID, you know, hopefully vaccine COVID's gone, we mm -hmm. can not wear masks all the time and that kind of thing and cope back in and in a safe environment with knowing all the PPE things and carrying that forward be able to go into the nursing homes, get a count of how many and see how long it would take and maybe help mitigate some of that. But if a family member applies for a permanent advance, going to the, going to the nursing home isn't going to help any because we're going to mail that ballot to them. So it's, it's a good idea. There's just some um, inherent flaws in how it could work. But but anyway, to answer your question, we do, we do have a good relationship with them so that they can tell us, hey, there's these people that can't sign and this person will. We know who the activity director is and the bigger ones. Um, and so we kind of know what names would probably be on there. Because usually it's the activities director in the yeah. nursing home, it seems to me, that is the one that's helping with the voting and the registering to vote and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. When you were back on paper ballots, if I were walking in, not doing a mail-in this year, if I were to walk in, I'd probably ask for a paper ballot rather than go to a machine. Do you feel that that's... I, I pretty much got rid of all my machines. I, I have to have at least one machine really? everywhere because, wow. because it has to be able to read. Cause, okay, so the machine now is just a pen. It doesn't, it, it spits out the thing that marks it for you. And honestly, some people have really struggled with filling in the oval. Yeah. And those people, we've went ahead and gotten on the machine. And when it marks it, it's done an amazing service for those people. They, they can see, they can hear, everything's fine. But they're shaky. And, yeah. and they can't, and the oval's small, truly it is. And, and so it it's like went through the machine and it spit it back out and said unreadable marks. And, and when it does that, and we can kind of tell who comes in, and I'm talking in-person voting on this one, um, we'll, we'll lead them over to that one machine that we have, and it, then they can touch it, and it's much easier to touch without that kind of thing, and it prints it out. So then it goes into the machine. And so um, every so everything I, I print I've got um, I've got I'll print up seventy percent of my ballots on paper anyway because wow. the majority I think we had maybe twenty on the machine this last time. I'm just not we're we're totally it's like oh, one eighty from what it was before and we've just gone totally back to paper. So even if you get your ballot in the mail or you come in and that's where some people have been like, well, yeah, I had it mailed to me, but I want to vote in here. It's like, okay, well, that's great, but it's the exact same ballot. So, and you, now you're going to have to jump through more hoops because we mailed you a ballot. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. if you go back and get that ballot, mm -hmm. you can come and sit in the parking lot and vote your ballot, and then you can bring it right <laughs> in here and hand it to us. Yeah. It's going to be in the envelope. It has to be in the envelope and signed. Right. But you can bring it in, huh. and it's the same. No, you're not going to feed it into that machine. But I have a board of people who are going to open it and feed it into the machine 
for you. And yes, at that point you have to make that leap. And I think some people are have asked not to have it mailed to them because they they just they there there's just distrust. There there is, and I mean I understand, and it's absolutely that person's choice, and I just want them to vote. But but I've went back almost solely to paper, and that that's just what I've done. Huddo's printing does, and I I'll give kudos to him because. I mean, I've sent him ballots like, can you have these done tomorrow? Because I, I need to have whatever, and this one's been more, and he, he does, and he delivers them. He doesn't charge me to bring this stuff over. I mean, he's truly been amazing. If anybody needs to, he, and he does not gouge me for the prices at all. I mean, he's very reasonable, too. So are you an exception to Kansas? Um, most everything has changed. The bigger counties are still pushing towards the machines themselves. And, and, and here's, the, here's the flip side to that. When you go to the machine with the barcode and you've checked in at the polling place, there's, they have it set up. I did at first, but it, it just wasn't worth it because I was pretty much going all paper. That there's a barcode on there, so you click the barcode and it, it brings up the correct ballot. So you pull that human error out. So if I have a ticket that says you're supposed to get Winfield 7 and somebody gives you Winfield 3, they pull it out and give you that ballot and then you go vote it, you voted and some of the races are the same and maybe all of the races are the same, but it still could be the wrong one. Mm -hmm. So you're introducing human error. I've tried to mitigate that in my area by having one person check in and I have one person that does the ballot, pulls the ballot out, checks the ticket, pulls it out, and then I have a runner that is supposed to look at that ballot ticket and verify again. And in our office alone, we caught we caught several that had the wrong ballot, and when they went and looked, and, and most of it in the primary was Republican, Democrat, honest, which the person probably would, I mean, and some people did, they were handed the ballot and they know this obviously right away. but. Um, that they caught that and then went back and got the correct ballot. So it, it's not perfect, but it helps with the human error thing. So anyway, in big counties, I feel like that's why they've, I, I know that's why they've stayed that way because they've told me that. That's why they have because they have even, they have a harder time getting enough staff to work it and to be able to do that kind of thing. And so if you can take the human error out of something, it, it's just natural to kind of, you know, want to do that. It, it, it's the same as versus hand counting all the ballots that used to be done. That machine can do it faster and honestly more accurately mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. one person reading and two people writing. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're tired and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's human nature kind of thing. So. I have a question. In the last election, I was also given the wrong party, but they corrected it immediately. It was, it was super cool. Um, first question is, uh, if you fill out your ballot, but there's a uh, like an office, and you don't like anybody, or maybe there's only one person listed, and you don't mark it at all, does that invalidate the whole ballot? Oh, okay. You never have to. A lot of people, honestly, in the presidential election, a lot of people come and vote for president, and they don't vote for anything else. That's really? all they want to vote for. It yeah. just slays me, but I mean, it's obviously everyone's choice, but yeah. The second don't. question is, sometimes it'll have candidate's name, and then it'll have other. If enough people wrote in an other, and that person got the most votes, even if they hadn't campaigned, would they then become the candidate? Um, there are some offices that the write-ins don't get tallied. Okay, so for president, there's about 20, at least, people who have filed the fee to have their write-in votes collected. And really? like senators and that kind of thing, you actually have to file as a write-in candidate to have them tallied. I mean, when my write-in board does their tallying and stuff, I mean, we, we keep track of all of the write-ins, whatever they are, but they don't actually get reported or, I mean, I hate to say not tallied, because they are, but they aren't as far as a winner or whatever. But my township offices are a prime example. I mean, you could have somebody who, and somebody almost did, <laughs> and has before one versus somebody there. I mean, they were actively campaigning, obviously, there, and to get enough people to write them in. But it's it's the person with the most votes that wins, period. And if you don't get, I, I, and I had this happen this time too. I had a township office that 
they filed for office and I, I don't know why, but they obviously didn't even vote for themselves, and so they didn't win because they didn't get one single vote. <laughs> and I've never had that happen before, and so I had to like double check the Secretary of State's office. I'm like, okay, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, this is right. They didn't get one vote, and they're like, they didn't even vote for themselves. And I said, oh, well, I don't know. So and they said, no, you have to get at least one vote to win, and it's the person that gets one more vote than the other person that wins. So if he'd had one vote, he'd won. Uh -huh. Yes. If he'd have voted for himself. Well, he didn't trust himself. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they got busy and they didn't vote. I never really looked up to see if they voted or not. So. But on, there was a little extra. There were some other people that filed, and they really decided they didn't know if they wanted it or not. I mean, so there's other things, too. But I just have never had somebody actually file. It's only a dollar to file for county. But, but still, that was the first. I, I swear, every election, there's a first. So. Do you get a lot of Mickey Mouse? <laughs> Yeah, not as much as you think. We get more, especially in the primary, you get more people that, like I'm a Republican, and so, I mean, I got a lot of write-ins on the Democratic side, Macy did, she's, I mean, you know, so you get more of that in like a primary. Um, you get a lot of the same names, so people just write like themselves or their buddy, and they'll write it in every single race, yeah. you know? Like, Whatever, I guess. Sometimes, but, but, but they'll vote one of the races. Rarely do I ever have one that's done that with all of them, which basically is a worthless ballot. They'll at least vote for whatever they wanted to, and it's the same thing. Sometimes I wonder if they wanted that thing. If I don't vote for everything, something, then the one I did vote for isn't going to count. But it does. But it does, yeah. And that's just more of the, it's probably something I need to, actually, I probably do need. Because I've been trying to do some more press releases. I should probably do some kind of press release because the papers don't really, not that anyone reads the paper anymore, but they've been really good about putting things, well, okay, okay. <laughs> everybody tells me they don't read the paper anymore, so, but I still try and put stuff in there. So I should probably do a press release about that right there. That might be yeah. helpful, too. I have I've had several people ask me if I knew if they didn't mark yeah, and I've had people ask that. I just never, I don't know, it never clicked in my head that I should do a press release explaining that. But I'm always so worried about explaining all the other things where we have a drop box, when it is, da, 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 all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, that was my, I worked at Parker Field, and we had several people, and I'm sure everybody did this, that came in and said, because they showed up with vans, well, they got that and they threw it in the trash because they decided they wanted to. Yeah. And so I thought, well, we need to educate them a little better that they can just bring it in and drop it. You know, don't throw it yeah. away if you get it. It's That's still, what we tried to. And I was yeah. going to do a press release. I yeah. I thought about that one and stuff on that. So, and this time I think I'll add to that one too because um, we have a Supreme Court justice and some appeals that are. It's that whole, do you want to retain or not? And that always throws people. <laughs> so, so I need to add that probably to that as well because I, I people don't. There's obviously not a write-in part, but I don't. I could probably add that into that press release that, you know, if they want to, yes or no, but if they don't want to, kind of, and then reminding people that there are those retention judges on the ballot. Well, I would like to give you kudos on the fact that you uh, let people do advanced voting at your office, and I love that, because there's not a crowd, it's a piece of cake, everybody's great in your office, love it. Well, I also have it in Ark City, and I'm doing it. Usually I've only done it like two or three days. I'm only doing it the week before the election, and I'm going to do it from like 9 to 5 on Monday, and then I'm going to do the same hours that we're going to have, 7.30 to 5, Tuesday through Friday. It's still, I've heard through the grapevine that Arkawal is going to get canceled. I don't know that that's the case, but I've heard that maybe, that was my only concern for, because that would be Arkawal a week, so yeah, I don't know if that'll help or hurt my turnout down there, but I'm going to have an in-person advance voting down at the water treatment. Great, well, that's so great. Yeah, so it's been that's a great place to be able to have have it. It's got good yeah. parking. Uh -huh. right. It's kind of far south on town, uh, you know, in town, but it's easy to get in and out of there. So I've been pretty happy with having it there. So that's. Does anyone have any other questions? I never think I'm going to talk as long as what I do, and then I just stop going over Thank you very much. Yeah. Very important. I mean, you, you've been turning over every stone I can tell on all of those things. It's incredible. I feel 
very confident that we're seriously on track for sure.